a very good evening to all of you i welcome you all to the ican initiative the hindu and indian express analysis so we will start the day with a prelims theme of the day so here is a little tweak that i have introduced into this ican initiative i have seen that i keep getting so many mails and messages about uh, many of you being very insecure about the prelims preparation so what we have done is just to introduce some uh, minor tweak in the initiative where we'll be discussing some prelims also uh, every day so if you analyze the previous year's papers you will see that there are certain themes which is uh, which is upsc's favorite those themes keep repeating year after year just asking different questions from the same thing so uh, i will make a list of these most important themes which are asked by upsc almost every year and i'll give you an assignment every day on that theme to collect some information so you can write that in the comment box whatever i am asking every day under the theme of the day exercise whoever writes a very holistic piece of information that piece of information is going to be pinned by the insight so, so that will be a pinned comment for the others to uh, look at it as a reference and to learn about that so today the theme of the day we have selected as buddhism and jainism so this is being repeated by upsc every year almost whenever i have written every time i see a question more than one question on buddhism and jainism so what you have to do today is you will have to uh, tell about the literature that is related to buddhism and jainism about the various sects which are in buddhism and jainism and also the various philosophies which are associated with buddhism and jainism so all these three under these three headings you will have to write in the comment section the more holistic one is going to be pinned so now we will start with the first topic of the day so first we will be talking about the power of the speaker so the uh, issue that was in uh, recent news was that the speaker of the rajasthan legislative assembly who is cp joshi he has approached the supreme court through a plea challenging a high court order so the rajasthan high court had ordered that the speaker should not take any decision uh, immediately on the disqualification petitions that were against uh, the deputy chief minister that is the sachin pilot and 18 other congress mlas so uh, uh, rajasthan high court said that uh, the speaker will have to give some more time to these mlas including sachin pilot before deciding on the disqualification petition so therefore the speaker cp joshi has now approached the supreme court saying that the high court does not have a power to tell anything related to the anti defection or the disqualification pertaining to this case so under this what we'll be looking at is an important uh, supreme court judgment so which you using in your answers that is nothing but the kihoto holahan case so what this case deals with is the power of the speaker whether the speaker's decision is subject to judicial review and when is it subject so the constitution provides that it is the speaker who will be deciding on the disqualification under the 10th schedule that is anti defection clause the speaker will be deciding that so before the kihoto holahan case the uh, what prevailed was that whatever is the decision of the speaker related to the disqualification under anti defection that is going to be final but later on it was felt that uh, a judicial review of this uh, is a welcome will be a welcome thing so therefore under kihoto holahan case it uh, the supreme court decided that it uh, gave a judgment saying that once the speaker has decided on a disqualification petition then it may be subject to judicial review only in on a limited case that is that is on limited grounds the supreme court can uh, take up the decision of the speaker that has already been given by the speaker and then decide upon it so whether the decision of the speaker is valid or not so this can be done only on limited grounds so therefore even by going with the kihoto holahan case in the present case the speaker has only been uh, has only accepted the notices on disqualification but has not yet given the decision so kihoto holahan case clearly ap applies only after the speaker has given its uh, his or her final decision so only then the kihoto holahan case applies so what the use of this case is that whenever you have a question on the powers of the speaker and whether uh, you may have a question like uh, speaker is a very important functionary in the parliament and uh, 
critically analyze the issues associated with the office of the speaker so in that case one very important issue is the speaker's power to uh, decide on the disqualification petitions pertaining to the anti defection law so in this case you have to mention the kihoto hollahan case so mentioning such judgments is going to add more value to your answer so now we'll move to the next topic the next topic we'll be discussing is the issues related to the judiciary so in this the recent news is that the uh, former royal uh, the raja man singh case in that case the court has now given the sessions court in mathura has now given its judgment raja man singh was a royal in rajasthan in bharatpur in rajasthan and in the year 1985 he was killed by the police saying that uh, this happened in an encounter so this case was pending before the court for uh, nearly 35 years now and after a span of 35 years the mathura uh, sessions court has now sentenced 11 police personnel uh, regarding this murder in the murder of the head of this princely states of bharatpur uh, that is the raja man singh so what this brings uh, forward is the issue of delayed justice in the indian judicial system so we have already we often hear about uh, the fact that the justice delayed is justice denied so even in this case the justice has been delayed for nearly 35 years so it was after a span of 35 years that these policemen have been uh, charged of murdering the uh, raja man singh similarly such uh, huge delays can also be seen in the assassination of the railway minister ln mishra that happened in 1975 so this ended in a conviction in a year 2014 so you can see how much uh, delay is involved in our uh, judicial system even in the hashimpura case where nearly 40 muslims were massacred in the year 1987 so this ended in the year 2015 with such a huge amount of delay and that too it ended with an acquittal so the court said that it did not have uh, enough evidence to hold somebody guilty so therefore all the accused were acquitted and for acquittal also it took such a huge amount of time so these are the examples which shows how much delayed our uh, justice delivery system is so whenever you are talking about judicial reforms one definite uh, reform that is needed is in the speed of uh, justice delivery so in that case one issue when you write as a side heading in the speed of justice delivery or delays in the justice delivery so you can quote these three cases as your examples and say that such huge amounts of delays are involved so a justice delayed is amounts to justice denied so these can be used as examples in your case so the next topic will be um, this editorial was on the reasons why a high court needs to be set up in puducherry so though it is not directly relevant to the examination because it is very specific about a high court being setting up set it, uh, being set up in uh, puducherry uh, this offers an important answer writing tip for us that is uh, the importance of quoting the judgments so in this whole article uh, which was not relevant from the exam point of view there was one single judgment which, which was mentioned which is definitely very important from the exam point of view so this judgment was the all india judges association and others versus union of india so it was in this case that the supreme court acknowledged that uh, the judicial in the judicial system in order to increase the access to justice the judge strength will need to be improved in the country so in this uh, case the supreme court held that from an existing judges to population ratio of nearly 13 judges per 10 lakh population 10 lakh is nothing but 1 million so 13 judges per 1 million population we have to move to at least uh, 50 judges per 1 million population so this was what the supreme court viewed in, in this popular judgment so the same opinion was also voiced out by the uh, law commission in its uh, report in the year 2014 that we need to improve the judges to population ratio so uh, but in spite of the judgment and also the law commission report even in the year 2016 the ratio of judges to 1 million population was just 12 so that is we have just 12 judges to 1 million population which is very low in the country so this uh, judgment you can use it to argue that we need to have uh, more judges per population so previously we saw a judgment uh, previously we saw the examples of cases where there have been delays 
and one solution for that is also to have uh, increased number of judges so when you talk of increased number of judges you can talk about the 2014 law commission report and also this judgment by the supreme court the ideal ratio is 50 judges to 1 million population but what we have as of 2016 is 12 judges to 1 million population so quoting of judges and your uh, judgments and your answer is very important to add more value the next topic we'll, we're going to look at is the Jammu and Kashmir issue. So this can come as a uh, an example in a broader question that is asked on the freedom of expression or it can come as a standalone question regarding the issues that are that is uh, being faced by the people of Jammu and Kashmir. So when the article 370 uh, was diluted in the August of 2019, after that the internet restrictions were imposed on the state. So as far as the restrictions that are Im imposed on the internet is concerned, it raises important questions about the fundamental right of the freedom of expression. So on this, several petitions have been filed in the court on which two important judgments are, uh, are worth remembering. So the first judgment is the Anuradha Bhasan judgment, uh, uh, Anuradha Bhasan versus Union of India. The judgment was given in 2020 itself. So what did it... Uh, what the judgment said. So first of all in the petition Anuradha Basin argued that um, this whole uh, the document in which the government passed to this order that there are going to be restrictions on the internet speed was not put up in the public domain. So but it is a right of the people to know. So right to know is also a fundamental right under extension in of a fundamental right under article 19. So people have the right to know what the order is and it should be put in the public domain. The second thing she argued was that the reason which the center was saying for imposing restrictions on the internet speed is because the presence of high speed internet is actually uh, giving uh, the terrorist elements an opportunity to use this to uh, on the one hand to even uh, uh, radicalize the youth and on the other hand to also plan their attacks in the country. So what she argued was there is no direct link between the speed of the internet and also the terrorist activities happening on in the state. And the third thing she argued was that there were other better uh, less restrictive alternatives that would have been available to the state to consider rather than just uh, outrightly imposing restrictions on the internet uh, by reducing the speed to just the uh, th there were no internet uh, connections uh, rather the internet was completely banned initially and later on now just a restricted speed that is the 2G speed is now allowed. So what she argued was that there were there could have been other better alternatives like for example some uh, websites uh, could have been blacklisted or there could have been some targeted surveillance measures. So rather than all this what the center did was a blanket internet shutdown in Jammu and Kashmir. So this ended up targeting nearly 8 million people in the state and a vast majority of these people hardly have any link with terrorism but still they were at the receiving end or at the suffering end. So these were the arguments that were made by Anuradha Bhasin in this um, but in her petition. So finally in January 2020 the Supreme Court gave the judgment in which it uh, first of all acknowledged the fact that yes. Uh, the right to free speech and the freedom to do business both are impacted by the uh, internet because internet is an important medium where the people voice out people voice out their opinion and it's also a medium through which a lot of businesses are conducted. So Supreme Court acknowledged the fact that this restrictions on the internet or banning the internet does have implications on the people's right to free, uh, the freedom of speech and their freedom to do business. But however, what eventually the uh, court did was that it just uh, told that a review committee should be set up weekly under the temporary suspension of telecom services rules and uh, that committee will have to do a weekly review of the uh, necessary necessity to impose such uh, restrictions on the internet. So that was the only thing which the Supreme Court uh, held in that Anuradha Bhasin case. But however, it acknowledged that the uh, freedom of internet is very essential for freedom of expression and the freedom of business. The next important case that we need to understand is the foundation of the media professionals case. So uh, now that the pandemic has started and there was lockdown everywhere across the country, 
it was felt that uh, in access to internet is very important to even access some critical services people were ordering medicines and groceries also online which couldn't be done in the state of jammu and kashmir because of a ban on the internet also many children uh, who could not go to school were accessing their uh, classes through the internet so all of these could not be possible because of the ban so uh, this under this case the foundation of media professionals argued that internet has uh, this lack of internet in the state has actually put the citizens at a disadvantageous position where they are unable to do business in the lockdown where they are unable to get themselves educated through online classes during the period of lockdown but however what the supreme court eventually held in this case supreme court set up a three member committee that was headed by the home secretary so this committee is going to look into this uh, restrictions on the speed of internet in jammu and kashmir so if we say that this committee is comprising of the home ministry uh, secretary of home ministry and other members and there is clearly a conflict of interest because uh, it was the executive that imposed the restrictions on the speed of internet in the state and a committee of executive has only been now asked to review this so there is a clear conflict of interest that is involved here so this you can also use as an example when in paper 4 the gs4 ethics paper you may have a question like define conflict of interest and give examples to uh, support it or to um, illustrate it so in that case you can use this as an example where the supreme court uh, asked to set up a three member committee which is headed by the home secretary to review the restrictions that have been imposed on the speed of internet in jammu and kashmir so executive is being asked to, to review executive's own actions so there is a clear cut conflict of interest in this case so even if you have a broader question on the freedom of expression so you can uh, write about the judgment of anuradha bhasan where uh, the supreme court acknowledged the fact that the freedom of uh, to have internet access is definitely a part of the freedom of expression and also the freedom to do business so this one uh, is a very important judgment so even previously we had discussed this issue in our previous class in our previous videos where we had seen that whenever government has to impose certain restrictions on the freedom of the people it has to first uh, ensure that this uh, such restrictions pass the these three important tests only then such restrictions can be imposed one is the relevance that is whenever some restriction is being imposed the question to be asked is will it serve the objective that the government wants to achieve in this case government wants to reduce the terrorist related activities in the state so the question to ask is whether restricting the internet in the state is going to achieve this objective so is it relevant is a first question to be asked second is the doctrine of proportionality so a less severe uh, restriction or a less severe method ha had could have been adopted to achieve the same and so it, whether it is proportional or it is uh, it is too much so this is a second question that needs to be asked the third is uh, whether any less restrictive methods could have been used to achieve the same ends in this case for instance uh, in the anuradha bhasan judgment the petitioner had argued that uh, there could have been less uh, restrictive methods like blacklisting some of the websites or some targeted surveillance measures that could have been undertaken rather than a blanket ban on the internet in the state so the third question to ask is whether some less restrictive methods are available to achieve the same objective so this is a three part test which every such restriction that the center seeks to impose on the citizens needs to pass to uh, be held valid in the court of law we move on to the next topic which is a small data on the criminalization of politics in rajya sabha so this is a data that uh, that the rajya sabha members had themselves submitted through their affidavits so the ngo association for democratic reforms uh, the adr has analyzed this data that is the affidavits which the politicians have filed themselves and it has come out with a data that nearly 24 percentage of the members of the rajya sabha they have declared that they have criminal cases against them pending so this uh, points out to the prevalence of criminalization of politics in rajya sabha the second uh, what the adr report also notes is that uh, 89% of those uh, mps of rajya sabha who were analyzed they had their assets declared worth more than 1 crore 
so this shows the prevalence increasing prevalence of the crorepati mps in the parliament so this is an indication of the money power that is uh, in the uh, prevalent in the parliament so these data you can use and you can quote a uh, uh, name of association for democratic reforms which is a very credible ngo in this field so this data is very important when you are talking about electoral reforms uh, next is a small piece of information related to art and culture so this was also pointed out by one of you in the comment section yesterday and this was there in news today that a madhubani artist uh, remant kumar mishra uh, he was actually a madhubani artist and uh, because of the lockdown and the pandemic so there was a lot of adversity that he faced but eventually what the article says is raman uh, kumar mishra he decided to turn this adversity into an opportunity so he started to make masks which had hand painted madhubani paintings on them and he started to sell these masks so uh now he says that there is so much demand for the masks that have been hand painted with madhubani designs that now he is uh, he engages nearly 300 villagers so he is giving employment to nearly 300 villagers including 15 tailors have been roped in to make these uh, masks and he himself paints these uh, madhubani hand painted uh, is on is done on the masks so first of all what this shows is uh, the how the water all the ways through which we can revive these traditional arts like the madhubani or the mithila paintings the second it shows us how art and culture can itself be a remunerative enterprise uh, particularly when we are talking about reverse migration and the migrant workers going back to their village and we are talking about creating or generating more jobs in the village this serves as a very uh, good example of how the traditional arts in those villages can be uh, rejuvenated and how they can be encouraged and promoted to generate such jobs and which is going to create niche markets for these traditional arts and crafts so these are the various uh, uh, areas where you can use one is in the art and culture and second is in uh, job generation or uh, job creation particularly in this trend of reverse migration after the pandemic so these were the other articles which were not relevant from your exam point of view so we will now look uh, quickly revise uh, the yesterday's assignment so many of you have written uh, all these five points which i asked you to write yesterday so that's a brilliant response from all of you so don't think that either way some of them have already written so there is no point in me writing the same things again uh, all of uh, that does matter and only when you write you remember when somebody else writes and you just happen to read it and you feel that okay i didn't even put the effort somebody has already written and an i just read it so you are not going to remember it so you yourself read and write in the comment section that's when you're going to remember it for a longer time so we'll quickly go through this in the case of appointment um, the important issues are appointing uh, appointment where these are mostly political appointments and then removal because of the doctrine uh, pleasure doctrine uh, where uh, the governor can be removed under the uh, pleasure of the president so therefore uh, governors have become political footballs where when there is a change of power at the center the governors are also removed so next is a partial role played by the governors as we discussed yesterday with respect to the west bengal governor next is a discretionary power enjoyed by the governors so sometimes they have misused this to call a party to form the government which doesn't really enjoy majority next is the accountability because uh, the governor is not elected but however he has he or she has vast amount of discretionary powers but because he or she is not elected they are not answerable to the people so therefore this also to an extent dilutes the accountability so these are the important issues and when we come to committee's recommendations for each of these issues you can come out with recommendations the panchi commission told that the appointment has to be made such that they are non political the person can be from outside the state and not be active in politics in the previous couple of years as far as removal is concerned uh, the national committee on review of working of constitution under uh, venkata chalaya uh, the committee recommended that this uh, pleasure doctrine needs to be removed and the governor needs to be uh, should be given security of tenure and uh, the procedure for removal of the government must be as uh, tough as the impeachment of the president 
so next is uh, when talking about the partial role that is played by the governor in this case the sarkaria commission also noted that uh, in order to ensure that the governors are not partial uh, and they don't end up having tiffs and fights with the state government a uh, sarkaria commission recommended that when the appointment of the governor is done then a consultation with the chief minister of the state has to be done so that there is a good rapport between the governor and the chief minister and they work towards a common goal for the welfare of the people similarly in the case of discretionary power again second arc commission says that uh, when the governor makes a report to the president for imposition of uh, emergency under article 356 the governor has to make a document and that has to be speaking in itself re- regarding what under what conditions the governor uh, Uh, was compelled to make such a report for imposition of 356 so all of these are the committees and their recommendations which you can talk about next is the ju- important judgments under this definitely one is the sr bomai judgment so where uh, the supreme court held under what uh, it held that the governor has to uh, make a document which uh, talks about the grounds that he had Uh, said for the imposition of 356 and the governor must not uh, uh, immediately suspend the uh, state legislator rather should keep it in suspended animation so these were the various things that uh, were told by the supreme court in the sr bomai case in the nabam rabia case the supreme court held that the uh, governor has a discretionary power which he can exercise under article 163 but however this has to be used very judiciously it should be in sync with the constitutional spirit in the bp singal case the supreme court te- uh, told uh, commented regarding the removal of the governor that uh, just because there is a change in the party in power at the center that should mo- not be a sufficient ground for the removal of the governors in the states which are ruled by opposition parties so this was what held by the court in the bp singal case in hargobind pant and versus ragukul tilak uh, the court held that the governor uh, of in the state is an independent constitutional office and is not the subordinate or uh, any subservient to the president of india or it is not an office that is by under the central government it's an independent constitutional office governor is not an employee of the center in the lieutenant governor of delhi versus union of india the court held that a uh, governor is bound to follow the aid and advice of the council of minister in matters which are not under his discretion so these were the impeachments and then the important articles is 153 which says that there should be an office of the governor 156 uh, which talks about the removal of the governor so again this has to be made more stringent so that uh, the governors are not removed uh, based on the whims and fancies of the central government 163 says that the governor has some discretionary powers which he will exercise uh, on his own without the aid and advice of the council of ministers 159 which we saw yesterday that it says that the governor has a duty to preserve protect and defend the constitution of india then article 356 which is about the governor um, making a report to the president for imposition of article 356 which is nothing but the state uh, emergency so article 356 is about the state emergency next is the positive role that is played by the governor he is a friend guide and a philosopher in a federal polity he acts as a linking pin between the center and the states and he is also a contributor in the good governance because uh, for instance various raj bhavans uh, are environmentally very sound structures where uh, so many models have been incorporated like rainwater harvesting the solar panels and self sustained uh, buildings have been built so they can be models of such governance then also helps in stability whenever there is change in the uh, state governments after elections so sometimes there is a more instability when no party clearly comes to um, has majority during the, those times it's the governor who pr- provides that stability then the governor also has special powers uh, for instance under article 351 and from a to h also uh, j uh, the governor has special powers related to certain areas which are which require some special attention or which are more backward so these are positive roles 
so the today's issue is related to the speaker which uh, today we learned about the kihoto holahan case but we have already seen uh, the powers of the speaker and we have already uh, taken up a question on this so today also we'll go uh, revising this topic uh, the three issues related to the office of speaker three important articles and three important judgments so this is what you will have to uh, write today in the comment section so yeah so from today onwards uh, two things that has been incorporated in the i can initiative is instead of the motivation or the story of the day or whatever we have already done it now for three and a half months so we have already collected sufficient number of stories personalities quotes and all that and once the prelims examination is over we are going to resume with that exercise so that by means you have another three four months of quotes personalities and all that and that would be more than enough for you to be able to remember and reproduce in uh, answers wherever they are relevant so now because prelims is nearing in order to make this initiative more relevant for you from prelims point of view uh, in the beginning instead of the motivation or story of the day we'll have the theme of the day where the most important the mostly asked themes from the previous upsc papers will be selected and the most important topics from those uh, that theme i'm going to ask which you will have to write in the comment section and as i said the most holistic one is going to be pinned by the uh, insights and the last thing that we are taking up uh, whenever there is no new topic to be given as a question is a prelims trivia so the starting one uh, the first slide which i said is going to be on the theme of the day that is related to the static portions of your prelims and this prelims trivia is going to be related to your current affairs so we will be handling at least one uh, static part and at least one uh, current affairs question so today's question is uh, i commit which is recently in news uh, it's an initiative by which ministry ministry of power ministry of environment uh, forest and climate change ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare and ministry of health and family welfare so you have to answer this question again you can answer that in the comment section and you can also look into what i commit is so that's it for today thank you